Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to be here. My name is Andrew King, and I'm a scientist, and I'm very excited to talk to you today about our work in uh, computational supremacy in quantum simulation. The job that we're going to be doing with this experiment is a simulation of quantum dynamics. So I just want to give a little bit of an idea of why this is important. Richard Feynman famously said that if you want to make a simulation of, of nature, it had better be quantum. And that's because this is how materials behave and interact. So quantum dynamics is essentially um, the study of how a system or a material responds to a change in its environment. And here on the left-hand side, I have a picture of uh, a material which is a, a potential fuel cell cathode material. So it has potential practical applications in batteries, and structurally, it's a spin chain antiferromagnet. So in the beginning, people were trying to simulate systems like this uh, with kind of basic first order classical approaches, and you really get the wrong answer. And then you can simulate it with a slightly more sophisticated quantum classical approaches and still not quite the right answer. So the kind of thing that we're looking at uh, on the right-hand side is called a hysteresis loop. And this is what happens when you sweep a magnetic field back and forth. It has a magnetic memory, this material. And you can see these little bumps. These are called magnetic microphases. So if we really want to understand the dynamics of the system, we need to be able to simulate the true quantum dynamics and get these details right. The work that I'm going to be talking about is sort of a follow-on to our uh, research paper that was published in Nature last year on quantum critical dynamics in a programmable spin glass. Uh, this is the largest programmable quantum simulation ever performed. And it kind of took the approach of looking at uh, how a, a spin glass system, which is very relevant to optimization problems, how the system uh, behaves as you guide it through a quantum phase transition to reach a low energy state. Now, this low energy state, if you're not interested in condensed matter physics, tells you how much money is left on the table when you're done your work. On the right-hand side, you see three data curves drilling down towards the optimal solution. We've got quantum, we've got pseudo-quantum, and we've got thermal annealing. These are three types of dynamics, and you heard Alan talking about quadratic speedups and optimization. This is almost, in theory, this is almost exactly a, a quadratic speedup but for reasons that are totally separate uh, from Grover's algorithm. This is a, this is a condensed matter uh, critical dynamics speed up. So you can see the main point here is that the, the blue curve, oops, the dark blue curve <coughs> is the steepest. And this isn't seen just in experiment. This is also seen in theory that we developed. Um, so this is uh, the first time that we could see a uh, a genuine quantum speed up and approximate optimization that was backed up by theory. And to do this, we're stripping away any classical coprocessing and we're just looking at what's going on in the computational core. <clears throat> so we kind of know in our hearts somehow that it's totally beyond hope to simulate a 5,000 qubit system in terms of the, the quantum Schrodinger dynamics. So we thought that this is probably a good candidate for a, a supremacy demonstration. But you really have to do your homework because you could get tripped up by things like decoherence, you could get tripped up by uh, short coherence lengths, anything that could make it uh, you know, have some sort of a backdoor to classical simulability. So what we're doing here in this work is we're generalizing this demonstration and, <clears throat> and we're making sure that there's no other way to do it. We didn't have the expertise in-house. We have a lot of experts on quantum computing, but we, need, uh, we needed to enlist a global team of experts. And to do that, we uh, enlisted collaborators uh, from across the globe, uh, starting with the Quantum Matter Institute at UBC, to Boston University, to ETH Zurich and, and Jagiellonian University in Poland. And the result was posted on the archive uh, in March and it's called Computational Supremacy in Quantum Simulation. This is a work that we're really proud of, and it was a huge team effort. So please check it out. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a taste of what we've done. Okay, so the experimental flow is you choose an input, and we're gonna choose different inputs of different dimensionality. 
We're going to do square, which are two-dimensional lattices, cubic and diamond, which are three-dimensional, and biclique, which are infinite dimensional and have particular applicability to neural nets. Once you take your, your lattice connectivity, you take every edge or every little line in this lattice and you assign it a random energy term. This turns it into a hard optimization problem or a disordered spin system, depending on your perspective. And we're going to look at what happens when you start in a quantum paramagnetic phase and guide it into a low energy uh, Ising spin glass. So that's a classical system. And on either side, you can simulate this system. It might be really hard, but you can do it. Uh, but in the middle, as you smash through this quantum phase transition, we're going through this quantum phase transition over a, a period of about 10 nanoseconds, so it's quite short. As you hit this quantum phase transition, you scatter into this cascade of excited states, and this is what's really difficult to simulate. So we want to call in uh, state-of-the-art methods, and so we're not just going to use the QPU, we're also going to use uh, tensor, tensor network-based methods and uh, neural network-based methods. And we're going to ask everybody to solve the problem to the QPU error. This is the task that we set to the classical computers. We're going to say, how long does it take you to get the same quality of answer as the QPU? <clears throat> So I'm going to talk briefly about three classical challengers, and then I'm going to throw two of them away because they're not competitive. MPS is, is a very standard method. It's called TensorTrain, DMRG. And this is a, a method to approximate quantum dynamics by laying all your qubits out on a line, sweeping back and forth, and approximating the wave function with tensors of bounded size. So it's a, it's a matrix of a, of a fixed size that you use to, to approximate your, your quantum wave function. So this is really uh, actually very convenient because it allows you a single parameter that, that dominates the analysis, uh, which really simplifies things. So this is called the bond dimension, how big your tensors are, and it controls not only the, the memory and time requirements, but also the quality of your solution. This is the best method overall that we found to solve these problems. We also used PEPs, which is uh, kind of a two-dimensional generalization, sort of, of this, of, uh, this tensor train method. Uh, which is really, really good for solving problems with uh, short correlation length. And this is what everybody used to spoof IBM's results when they came out last year, if you remember that kerfuffle. And then we're also going to look at NQS, um, but I'm not going to talk about this. This is uh, approximating the quantum wave function with a neural net, um, but we found that state-of-the-art methods were not competitive with MPS. So we're just going to focus on MPS, and we're going to move forward from there. Now, what did we use to run MPS? We used two supercomputers at the uh, Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, and we're very grateful to the support that they gave to this project. We would never have been able to do all these classical simulations without them. We used hundreds of thousands of GPU hours on the, on the Frontier and Summit supercomputers. Frontier is the most powerful supercomputer on the planet. So uh, this is the classical competition, and we're going to pit these against a D-Wave Advantage 1, and more importantly, an Advantage 2 prototype. I just want to talk uh, for a few minutes about a general structure of a supremacy claim, because no matter how you're doing it or what your application is, if it's just a toy problem or a real application, it has to follow a certain structure, logically speaking. So you need three main ingredients. The first ingredient is direct evidence that you're doing the right thing when you can confirm it with a classical simulation. So if you, if you do a very small problem and your quantum computer is giving you a different answer than your classical computer, then there's a problem. So you need to make sure you've got your feet on the ground, you know where you're starting, and you have a good characterization of the quantum system that agrees between classical and quantum. The next ingredient is uh, making the case that the classical method will scale hopelessly, or with a stretched exponential form or an exponential form. And to do this, we basically appeal to area law scaling of entanglement, and we show that the required bond dimension scales exponentially in the system size. Finally, the third and most challenging part is making the case that your quantum computer is getting the right answer when no classical computer can check it. So we're not quite at the point where a different modality of quantum computing can check our work because nobody can do simulations of this size other than us. 
Uh, and we don't have a ground truth that is calculated by classical simulation. So we need some way of uh, convincing ourselves and others that we're getting the right answer. And so you need to appeal to known scaling laws. The scaling laws that we're going to appeal to are the Kibble-Zurich mechanism. And this is uh, all, to, all to do with the theory of quantum phase transitions, which works really nicely in this context. <clears throat> I apologize. I'm going to show a few slides of data and equations, but not too much. So I'm going to start with uh, just a small example of a two-dimensional spin glass. So this is the simplest systems that, that we solved, two dimensions. And you can see it's got cylindrical boundary conditions. It's just a little cylinder. So you can see it's kind of it's quasi one-dimensional in a certain sense. And, and so it's not too bad for MPS. So we run the simulation between MPS and QPU. We, we run the same simulation. And here we're just going to look at a couple of simple observables. Q squared is the squared Edwards-Anderson spin glass order parameter. And it tells you how much order is in the system. So as you go slower and slower through this quantum phase transition, you kind of coalesce or crystallize into the ground state of the classical, so, uh, the classical problem at the end of the anneal. And so when you do that, you can see that this order parameter goes towards one. And if you anneal very fast, if your quench is very fast, then you have very little order in the system. And that just means you hit this phase transition so fast that no order had time to build up before the dynamics freeze. So the important thing is that we have the same answer here, we have the same answer here, and all the way down here across three orders of magnitude in quench time. <clears throat> the other observable that we're looking at here is residual energy per spin. And that's uh, taking an optimization perspective. It's saying, are you actually following the, the proper quantum dynamics for optimization? And the answer is, yes, we are. Now, there's a sweet spot. I'm going to stress this a little bit. If you go too fast, you remain uncorrelated after the process is finished. If you go too slowly, you, you're adiabatic. And that means that you're just dragging the ground state of a classical, finally classical system. And this is actually, it's an NP-hard problem, but it, it's relatively easy to solve compared to simulating the quantum dynamics. So we're going to hit this sweet spot in the middle where we're annealing not too fast and not too slow. This is a parametric Goldilocks zone. OK, so we want to get into a little bit more detail. And this Q, oops, this Q squared is <clears throat> actually uh, an average of 300 spin-spin correlations. And if we scatter these spin-spin correlations on a plot uh, between our ground truth and our experiment, we can see that we're not just getting the bulk right we're getting the, the microscopic details right as well. And this is really important. And this is how we're going to quantify our error. So we're going to compete between MPS and QPU. And you'll note that I'm comparing MPS against MPS here with different chi. Chi is the bond dimension. So this is the, basically the quality factor. We use chi equals 256 for these small instances as the ground truth. And we, can, we compare against chi equals 64. And this correlation error is um, just kind of an average root mean squared error on the correlations, normalized in the appropriate way. And you can see that uh, we get 0.059 for quantum and 0.081 for MPS at a bond dimension of 64. So those are kind of in the same ballpark. So we might have the idea that you can uh, get about QPU quality with bond dimension 64 for, for problems of this size. We can do a more complicated uh, measurement of quality doing something like the classical fidelity. Uh, and again, we get very comparable results. But classical fidelity doesn't scale nicely in the sense that um, it becomes uh, exponentially hard to actually compute. So <clears throat> we prove for small inputs that classical fidelity and correlation error give the same answer. And then we move forward with correlation error. Now. Talking about the QPU equivalent bond dimension, this is a key figure of merit. As you scale the system size, this is, these are L by L uh, 2D lattices, you can see that this error is basically flat. And if you look at how the bond dimension scales for MPS, you'll see that the bond dimension that you need to match the QPU error grows with system size. So this chi Q is the, the QPU equivalent bond dimension. This is the key thing that we want to hit and we want to analyze its scaling. So how does it scale? It scales exponentially. 
And you can see I'm, I'm looking at two different uh, anneal times here and two different processors. For the longer anneal, because of the better energy scale and the better coherence properties, Advantage 2 uh, has much better results. So we kind of say bye-bye Advantage 1. We're going to move forward with the Advantage 2 prototype for the rest of the paper. But the main point is that these uh, Chi-Q figures scale exponentially in, in system size. And this is what's going to make it intractable uh, and obviously and uh, you know, generally intractable for MPS. So I'm going to skip a bunch of details and just say that we have the same scaling forms for all of the systems, not just 2D, but also 3D, diamond, and by clique. So if we look at these four geometries, we want to make sure that we're getting the right answer on small inputs. And so we look at small inputs, 20 each. We're going to make 20 random inputs each, and we're going to run these at 7 and 20 nanoseconds. And basically what we want to see is everything falling on the diagonal. The median error here is about 1%. So we're really getting the right answer. For an analog quantum simulation, this is a very high bar to meet. And it makes things very difficult for the classical to match that quality. <clears throat> so now onto the scaling. Um, for the largest inputs, we cannot solve these. We cannot get a decent uh, simulation with classical methods. So we appeal to scaling laws. And I'm going to try to describe this in uh, not too much detail because it's kind of complicated. But what we do is we run uh, all these different geometries for different system sizes. These are the different shades, the, the different colors of the different geometries, and we run them for different anneal times. And what we end up having to do is line up this data for each geometry so you can see that this collapses on a universal curve. And, and we do this by shifting over the data by a factor of L to the minus mu. OK, so L is the linear system size. Mu is the kibble zurich exponent, the quantum kibble zurich exponent. You don't need to know what that is, but what we're doing here is collapsing the data to estimate the kibble zurich exponent. And then you can see if our results are scaling in the correct way to large system sizes where we can't do classical simulation. And luckily, people have estimated these exponents using uh, indirect means and uh, pencil and paper theory, depending on the system. And so we can compare against known results. And for one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and infinite-dimensional systems, we're right on the money for our kibble zurich exponents. And this gives us a lot of confidence that uh, we are getting the right answer for large systems. Now, Alan already showed this slide. So I might go through it a little bit too quickly. But if we look at the classical compute time, we can see that for the largest inputs that we're simulating, this is absolutely hopeless. Frontier, if we could magically parallelize everything and they let us run, the whole, uh, run on the whole processor or the whole supercomputer for a million years, we could solve some of them, some of the instances, um, whereas it takes uh, just a few minutes with quantum annealing. And in terms of uh, energy consumption, the bar here is global annual electricity consumption. This is obviously uh, totally infeasible, which is why we consider this to be in, in the supremacy regime. <clears throat> so just to wrap up, we've uh, shown supremacy on a problem of real importance. This is a quantum simulation of, uh, of uh, spin dynamics. We've got accuracy, where we can check it. We've got hopeless classical scaling, which is backed up by theory. And we've got beyond classical correctness, uh, where we can again uh, confirm this indirectly with scaling laws. So this is a problem of real importance with potential impact on materials, optimization, and AI. And you're going to hear a lot more about these applications throughout the day and tomorrow. And I'm going to wrap up there and thank you for your time. <clears throat>